If you've ever driven a car with cruise control, worked as a robot in a factory, or piloted a rocket, then there's a good chance that you use the PID controller. So, what is a PID controller? Well, to understand that, you need to know what a control loop is. A control loop has a system and a controller. The system is the car, robot, or rocket. The controller is a device that generates inputs for the system in order to reach or maintain some target. The input signal can't be calculated from the target value alone. The outside world may have some factors like drag or gravity that also affect the system by moving it away from the target. The current state of the system needs to be considered when calculating input. The target value and current value are used to calculate the error, which is the input for the controller. This creates a feedback loop that will eventually bring the system to the target value. For example, in a car, cruise control is a control loop which tries to maintain a constant speed. When the speed is too low, the throttle increases. When the speed is too high, the throttle decreases. If the car starts going uphill, the system will detect the drop in speed and increase the throttle in response. The cruise control is really a PID controller that sets the throttle position. PID controllers are one way to implement a control loop. They are used in many situations because they are simple, fast, and flexible. PID is an acronym that stands for Proportional, Integral, and Derivative. These are the three terms used to calculate the controller's output. The three terms are calculated from the error value using simple logic. The terms are added together to create the input signal. Each term handles a different problem that a system may encounter. We can look at Kerbal Space Program to see another example of a PID controller. In KSP, you can enable the Automatic Stability System to help fly your rocket. This system will automatically generate input commands to keep your vehicle stable. Let's say your vehicle is tumbling out of control and the ground is rapidly approaching. You might be able to recover control manually, but it's much easier to enable the ASS and let it fix the problem automatically. The ASS can regain control much faster than a human pilot could. This video will cover the implementation of a PID controller and give some tips on how to use them in your own game. All of the code is available in the GitHub repo linked in the description. I also uploaded a build to itch.io so you can try it out in the browser. This is the system we'll be using to develop the PID controller. It's a box which can move left or right by turning on its rockets. The PID controller doesn't actually move the box directly. It just calculates how to fire the rockets. If the PID returns 1, then the box moves at full power to the right. If it returns negative 1, then the box moves to the left. The blue boxes are target positions. The user can select which box is the current target. The goal is to use the PID controller to move the box directly over the selected target. We'll create a class and the main interface for the controller. DT is the time step of the simulation. Current value is the measurement of the system's current state. This is the feedback part of the controller. Target value is the target value. The return value is the output of the PID controller, which we use to move the system. Here's how the controller would be called by some other code. Since we're using Unity for physics, the DT is fixed time step. The box has a rigid body, so the current value is the horizontal position. The target value is whichever target position the user selects. There are some public variables we need to add to the class. The three terms of the PID controller can have different amounts of influence on the output. These are controlled by the variables P gain, I gain, and D gain. These values are multiplied by their respective terms. By changing the gain variables, the designer can tune a PID controller to have a specific behavior. The ability to tune a PID controller is what makes them so flexible. The demo also has a GUI to let you tune the gain variables without using the inspector. Now we can start implementing the PID logic. All output in a PID controller is based on error, which is the difference between the target value and current value. Error is not the same as distance. Distance is always non-negative. Error can be positive or negative. In other words, distance is the absolute value of error. If the box is here and the target position is here, then the error is positive. If the box is over here instead, then the error is negative. This is the main term of the PID controller and the simplest. The error is simply multiplied by the gain. This means the P term will be proportionally as large as the error. So when the error is positive, the P term creates a positive force. 
When the error is negative, it creates a negative force. If the error is large or small, it creates a large or small force respectively. The P term is used for large coarse tuning. This should be the first term to be tuned. When the error is large, the P term will be the largest influence on the PID controller. However, the P term by itself has limitations. If a system has momentum, like this physics driven box, then the P term can cause overshoot. When the box reaches the target position, the P term drops to zero, but the box still has momentum. It will pass the target and keep going until the P term applies enough force in the opposite direction. In fact, the P term acts like an ideal spring and will oscillate forever around the target value. Oscillation is one of the main problems you can face when using a PID controller. The D term gives you a way to limit the oscillation. If the P term acts like a spring, the D term acts like a dampener. The D term applies a force based on the derivative or rate of change of the error. So if the error is shrinking or growing rapidly, then the D term is strong. If the error is barely changing, then the D term is weak. The derivative of error is exactly the opposite of the box's velocity. Essentially, the D term acts as a braking force that gets stronger when the box moves faster. As the box approaches the target, the P term gets weaker, the D term applies a braking force, and the box slows down. If the P and D terms are well tuned, the system will smoothly approach the target without overshoot. To calculate the derivative, we store error last, which is the error value from the last time step. The difference between these values is divided by the time step to produce the derivative. Then it's multiplied by the D gain and added to the output. There are some limitations if the derivative is calculated this way. Imagine the target is set to the middle position. When the box gets close, the target is suddenly changed to the leftmost box. The error last value stores the error based on the middle position, but the new error value is based on the left position. This causes the derivative to suddenly jump in value for a single time step. This is called a derivative kick, and it can cause instability and other unwanted behavior. While the D term normally applies a force in the opposite direction of the P term, a derivative kick can briefly apply a force in the same direction for a single time step. Remember earlier when I said the derivative of error is the opposite of velocity? This is true except when the target value changes. If the target value changes, the change in error will cause a derivative kick, but the velocity remains steady. So you can remove the derivative kick by using the velocity to calculate the D term instead of the error. Just calculate the derivative by storing the system value from the last time step. Most PID controllers will probably want to remove the derivative kick, so we can add a switch to let the user change the behavior of the D term, depending on their needs. Both types of derivative are calculated using the same method. The enum determines which type is used. Then that value is multiplied with the D gain. There's one final problem with the D term. It depends on the error or value from the previous iteration. What happens on the first iteration when there is no previous data? Well, c -sharp initializes the member variables to zero, so the derivative formulas effectively become this. The initial iteration can cause a large D term for a single frame, much like a derivative kick. The solution is to skip calculating the D term on the first iteration. Finally, a method is added to reset this variable. Reset will be called if the system is moved by external means, such as being teleported, or if the PID controller has been turned off for a long period of time. Let's change the scene so that the box moves vertically. The targets are at different heights and the box needs to fight gravity to move upwards. Gravity applies a constant force downwards. The box can fire its rocket to move upwards or hover. Notice that the box never quite reaches the height of the target. Even when it comes to a stop, the box hovers at a level slightly below the target. This is because the P term is zero when the error is zero. So the box can't hover at the target altitude. It eventually settles at the altitude where the P term balances with gravity. 
This is called steady state error. The I term or integral term is used for eliminating steady state error. It's called integral because it integrates or sums the error over time. The longer an error exists, the stronger the I term gets. So if the box is hovering just below the target, the I term will grow until it balances gravity. To implement this, we add a new member to the class definition, integration stored. The current error value is multiplied by the time step and added to this variable. Integration stored can be positive or negative. If the error is non-zero, then this value will grow. If the error is zero, then it doesn't change. Maintaining an error in one direction will eventually lead to a larger value in integration stored. The I term should eventually find the correct value to balance gravity with zero error. Using an I term introduces additional problems though. When the error is reduced to zero, the P term will also be zero, but the I term can still be large. This can cause even worse overshoot than the P term, a condition called integral windup. Not only can the momentum carry the system past the target value, but the integration will be wound up by storing a large value. The I term can carry the system further beyond the target as this value is wound down. One solution is to have a limit for how large the integration stored can be. We add another public variable called integral saturation. This is used to clamp the value of integration stored. This is another value that must be chosen by the designer of the PID controller. A good starting point for this value is to set it equal to the input limits of the system. If the system only accepts inputs in the range negative 1 to 1, then the integral saturation should be set to 1. This solution still allows for windup, but it's so small that it's quickly corrected. This is probably good enough for most uses. There are more advanced anti-windup measures, but I won't be covering them. Finally, the three terms are summed together and clamped to the range output min, output max. These limits depend on what inputs the system can accept. The scene where the boxes moved horizontally allowed a range of negative one to one. This is like an electric motor that can run at full speed and forward and reverse. The vertical scene had a range of zero to one. This is like a rocket that can only apply thrust in one direction. To move downwards, it has to turn off the engine and let gravity take over. Our PID controller can be used to control a rotating system. Let's say we have a turret that can rotate 360 degrees. Here, the PID controller works on angles, not position. The PID logic we have can handle this case with only simple modifications. The problem is, in a rotating system, 345 degrees and 15 degrees are only 30 degrees apart, but a naive PID controller would see these values as being 330 degrees apart. This would cause major problems for the PID controller when the current value and target value are on opposite sides of the zero value. The solution is to calculate the difference between the angles, accounting for the point where 360 degrees wraps around to zero degrees. We also need this difference to have the range minus 180 to 180 for the PID logic to work correctly. We add a new function, angle difference. The difference between two values is of course A minus B. Degrees of rotation are a modular system, so we take the difference modulo 360. The modulo operator doesn't work if A minus B is negative, so we add 360 inside the parentheses. This returns values in the range 0 to 360, so we need to remap the angles by adding 180 to the term in the parentheses and subtracting 180 after the modulus. We can simplify this to 540. Now the output range is minus 180 to 180. We add a new function, update angle, to the PID class for handling rotating systems. The error, error rate of change, and value rate of change are calculated using the new angle difference function. All other PID logic remains the same. Our PID controller can now correctly handle rotating systems. Using this turret, we can walk through the process of tuning a PID controller by hand. The target is this box which moves back and forth. Our goal is to tune the PID controller so that the turret accurately follows the box. The system starts with all gain variables set to zero, so the turret doesn't move. We set the P gain to one, so the turret starts tracking the box. The turret now follows the box, but there's some subtle oscillation. We set the D gain to one. This fixes the oscillation, but now the turret is lagging significantly behind the box. We can reduce the D gain to 0.1 to reduce how much it lags. 
There is still a small amount of steady state error, so we set the integral saturation and eye gain both to 1. Now the turret is closely following the target. PID controllers are a simple but powerful method of automatically controlling a system. It can't be used to solve every problem, but it's a good starting point for any physically based system. The itch.io demo allows you to tune PID gains in real time. You can use this to test how different values affect the behavior of the system. If you dislike this video and want to see less like it, go ahead and click that dislike button.